G'day everyone, my name is Russ Wheatley from Max Design. I'm going to be talking today about three quick tips for accessibility in HTML5. Now, in the program it did mention there are five tips, but due to downscaling and government cutbacks, we're now only going to do three. So Charles has already given you a broad overview of HTML5 and accessibility. My role, or I'm going to focus, on a few quick aspects about HTML5 and accessibility, more of a micro view rather than a macro view. First of all, I want to talk about the section element. As you all probably know, HTML5 gives us a wide range of new semantic elements. These include things like the header, nav, section, article, aside, the newly introduced main element, footer, figure, and even fig caption. The section element is used for thematic grouping of content, according to the spec. Basically, that means a chunk of content that has a single theme. Now the theme of each section should be identified with a heading element, h1 to h6. That means that every time you introduce a section, you should theoretically introduce a heading as well. Now here we have a code example. First of all, we have a section element, and inside the section element we have an h2. The content of the h2 says, all about apples, which presumes, of course, this section is all about apples. The section element is not a replacement for the div element. The div element should always be used for generic containers. The section element is also available to assistive technologies. This section element is mapped as a region. Now this means that for assistive technologies that support HTML5 elements, the section element is announced and it will say region start every time it hits a section element and then region end every time it leaves the section element. For this reason, we should only use a section element for its intended purpose. We shouldn't use section elements all over the place willy-nilly. And when we are using a section element, we should always include a heading. Now we can provide additional meaning, and that can be provided with the aria labeled by attribute. And in this code sample, we have the section element and an h2 inside, once again, and the content is all about apples. However, the section element has an attribute called aria-labeled by, and the value is set to section-apples. The h2 element also has an attribute, and the attribute is an id, and the value, like the labeled by, is section-apples. So the, the aria-labeled by and the id work together to tie these two elements together. Next up, I want to talk about the summary attribute. Some attributes from HTML4 are no longer allowed in HTML5. One of these is a summary attribute, which is applied to the table element. Now, I'm sure all of you know this, but the summary attribute is used to provide assistive technologies with additional information about the table. And here we have a code example, a start and end tag for the table element. And inside the start tag, we have the attribute called summary, and then the value would be whatever you want to do to describe that uh, table element. Now, it may come as a surprise, but a lot of accessibility experts aren't happy at all with this attribute being removed. So how can we provide this additional summary information to a table if we can't use the summary attribute? Well, the simplest solution is just to provide the additional information directly above or below the table element. And here's a quick code example. In this case, there's just two elements. There's a paragraph element and a table element. The paragraph sits above the table and it just has the summary information directly in there. That could also be put below the table instead. Now you can get a bit fancier and you can place all of the relevant content inside a figure element. And then the summary information can be put inside the fig caption element. So here's another code example. In this case, we have the figure element. And inside, we have two elements, fig caption and table. The fig caption contains our summary information that's associated with the table. Now, this is a completely valid use of the figure and fig caption elements. You are allowed to use them for much more than just for images, as a lot of people presume. You can use them for all sorts of things, such as not only images, but code examples, uh, table information, uh, spreadsheets, all sorts of information that may be relevant. You can also provide additional meaning by using the aria label by attribute, like we did earlier. 
So here's a new code example. This time, once again, we have the figure element, and inside we have two other elements, the fig caption and table. However, in this case, they have some additional attributes. The fig caption has an ID and the values summary one. The table has aria labeled by, and again, the value is summary one. The last thing I want to talk about is the A element. Now in the past, the A element was always considered an inline element. Inline elements were never allowed to wrap around block level elements. That was considered the work of the devil. So here's an example of how A elements should have been used in the past. We have a paragraph element and then some text inside. The text says a simple link. And the word link is wrapped inside an A with an href. Now that's how the A element should be used, theoretically, as an inline element. It's not wrapped around the paragraph. Now with HTML5, the A element is now allowed to wrap around entire blocks of content, and it creates what's called a block link. And the spec actually states, the A element may be used to wrap around entire paragraphs, lists, tables, and so forth, even entire sections, so long as there is no interactive content within, e.g. buttons or other links. So here's an example of what is acceptable in HTML5. In this code example, we have a paragraph, and the content says a simple link again, but the A element is wrapped around the entire paragraph. I suppose the question you're asking is, why would this be allowed when it breaks the very laws of nature? Well, there may be times when you want to link to multiple elements inside one container, and all of those links go to the same location. An example would be a link going off to a thumbnail, a link going off to a heading, and even a link inside a paragraph of text. So all of those links might be going to the same location. Now for assistive technologies, that can be quite confusing because there might be two, three, even four links going to the same location. Now here's an example. We have a div element, and inside the div we have an image, we have an h2, and we have a paragraph of text. Wrapped around the image, we have an a href element. So that image is clickable. The content of the H2 is also clickable. So there's two links going off to the same location within the one div. Now by wrapping the A element around the entire block, there's only one link required. So here's the, another code example. We have a div again, and inside we have an image, and we have an H2 and a paragraph. However, instead of multiple links inside the div, we have one A wrapped around the entire div. That means that the user can click anywhere on that div and be taken to our target page. Now, while this can reduce confusion for some assistive technologies, it can also make things more confusing for others. In 2011, Steve Faulkner did some extensive testing on uh, block links and came up with some findings. Now, you can read the full list of all the issues by doing a Google search for HTML5 Accessibility Chops, colon, block links. It was written in 2011, but it's still relevant today. Now, the bottom line in Steve's article, he says that a link should contain a brief description of the link target. But more importantly, it should include the key information at the start of the link. That can alleviate some of the concerns that were found by Steve in his article. But I can see what you're thinking about. There's got to be more issues. And the answer is yes. Some browsers don't display these block links correctly. And there are a range of issues that can present themselves. They can include things like, some won't change the cursor, so you can't tell that that whole chunk of content is now a link. And some do even worse, and they convert everything into a link, so any content inside that block will all be underlined. Now, a safe way to get around this is to apply a class to any instance of the block link and then use the following three declarations for that class. So here we have a bit of CSS. Our selector is a.blocklink. So we're assuming the class is called block-link, and you'd apply that to any a that is wrapped around a block of content. And inside the uh, declaration block, there are three declarations. The first one is display colon block. That's changing any element, any a element, that's given this class to a block. The second thing is we've got text-declaration dec none. So we're basically just turning off underlines. And the third declaration is cursor colon pointer. And what we're doing here is making sure that all browsers 
will convert that cursor to a pointer so people know that that whole block is clickable. With those three declarations, we can solve a lot of the problems that browsers face when trying to render these block links. So, if you want to use these block elements, please be aware of these extensive potential issues, as well as some of their benefits.